So I know you guys would rather see me get David Sugarbaker and a half Nelson. Uh, I don't think I'd win that fight. Uh, but just for the purposes of full disclosure, uh, in the late 90s, I was in Boston and David Sugarbaker trained me. So uh, I'm not so sure if you're going to see us uh, battling like you'd like to see us. I, I could put Chris in a full Nelson if you want to put <laughs> so, um, uh, so I'll talk about the role of decortication, but you usually can't mention one without the other. Uh, and at our institution, there's a long history of treating asbestos-related diseases. It started with Dr. Selikoff, who made the connection between mesothelioma and asbestos. <clears throat> and the first extrapleural pleural as many of you think, it was Dr. Sugarbaker, but it actually was Irving Sarrett, also from Mount Sinai. So one point before diving into the surgical aspects of this disease, I want to make sure that we get a simple point that took me a little while to figure out, maybe I'm just slower than everybody else, is that we all know for lung cancer that smoking is a big component of lung cancer. And when you look over here, you'll see that uh, the smoking box gives you a certain risk of getting lung cancer. And when you look at asbestos, that gives you an even greater risk of getting lung cancer. And the synergistic effect is uh, when you take both of them, they're not just additive, but when you've been exposed to both, you get an extra box that puts you at higher risk. That's just one point aside from meso that I wanted to bring out. Uh, Dr. Sugarbaker already showed you some of this stuff. And what I'd like to do is just go into the staging system, and I'm not going to bore, bore you with TN and, TN and M. I want to show you how this disease develops. So basically, this is your right lung. You've got three lobes there, and the tumor likes to start on the parietal pleura, which is a little counterintuitive because you're inhaling these asbestos fibers, so you would think it would start on the visceral pleura, but it starts on the parietal pleura, maybe because when you inhale it, these little fibers are sticking out and it's continuously irritating the parietal pleura, which can cause what I would look as like a scar gone wild. Uh, so basically it starts on the parietal pleura and then it goes to the visceral pleura and then little by little it starts to go into the fissures and contract the lung. Up to that point many feel that <clears throat> a pleurectomy is possible with as David calls an MCR, we call an R1 resection. So uh, at this point you can still get an R1 resection uh, by a pleurectomy. Many believe that when it starts advancing and it starts going into the lung that an R1 resection is not possible and that you need to do an extra pleural pneumonectomy and there's various thoughts on that. When I first left the Brigham 15 years ago I thought the same way. At, with time I've realized you can, if you persist, get out many of these tumors without having to do an extra pleural pneumonectomy. Uh, that being said, I will still do it. There are many times you go in there and you see these multiple areas and the lung is completely had it, or I think an extra pleural pneumonectomy is the way to go. Uh, but of course, that's a point of debate, and I can't look at these two as saying they're mutually exclusive procedures. I think they're complementary. So uh, when you have one part of the chest wall involved, those patients actually do well. When you resect that part of the chest wall and you get rid of most of the tumor, there are long-term survivors uh, in that category. Then it invades the diaphragm, lymph nodes, etc. And then we go ahead and resect with an extra pleural pneumonectomy and reconstruct. So what are your surgical options? And you know, we can have this debate about uh, pleurectomy, decortication, uh, extrapleural pneumonectomy, but the bigger debate that's out there is whether or not you should do surgery for mesothelioma. There was the MARS trial uh, that was put together which said absolutely nothing. All it said is that you can't randomize the two. The conclusions I felt were very, very biased uh, in, in, against surgery. So as much as you can say we are biased for surgery, there are groups out there that are very biased against surgery. And the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. So what are your surgical options? You can just leave them alone and not do anything. I completely disagree with that. You can tout these patients, get rid of the pleural effusion, and help expand their lung. There's some rationale for that. Or you can do an MCR or an R1 resection where you do a pleurectomy decortication or an extra pleural pneumonectomy. And when you're looking at the studies that talk about supportive care, you have to be very careful what you look at because some will say 
Median survival, 18 months. Hey, that's in our best cohort we're getting that. So why do anything? When you look at that study, when they look at their survival time, what they do is they interview the patient and they say, all right, when did you first have any symptoms? Oh, doc, it happened about two, three years ago. And that's when they start their survival time. So you have to look specifically as to what are the parameters that, pay, that the investigators are looking at to describe uh, survival time. And the nihilistic approach, um, you know, there's big misconception about the surgical mortality with extrapleural pneumonectomy. And I think we've um, shown time and time again that it can be done safely. When you look at the old data, it was prior to immunohistochemical staining, prior to electron microscopy. So you're comparing, comparing apples and oranges. How do you know how many of those patients were meso and how many were actually adenocarcinomas? How many had meso that was already in the belly? Now we have CAT scan, we have PET scan. Back then it was just chest x-ray. So you have to be careful with those older studies. And when, as doctors, when we don't see something, when we have zero experience or little experience in treating something, we tend to want to do no harm. So lack of experience, you tend to do less. So this was one of the biggest studies uh, back in the 70s, 31% mortality. You tell me you're going to operate on me with 31% per mortality, I'll say you got rocks in your head, you're not touching me. So, but nowadays we know that we can get that mortality down to four to five percent. I'm not going to go through the staging, but different things have been done. Uh, brachytherapy, external beam radiotherapy, chemo ahead of time, chemo afterwards. Now, radiation ahead of time, intraoperative chemo. It was done in the 90s and it's being done again uh, by sugar bakers. So, all these things aren't amounting to much. When you look at all patients together, the survival in the best situations are going anywhere from 18 month median survival, maybe as high as 24 month median survival. Given it before, after, uh, it, it just doesn't seem like it's making any big dent. We need something bigger than what we're given right now. So the worst case scenario in my book and that is the most frustrating is when we do this on a patient, we put him through a big operation, we give him chemo, we give him radiation, and six months later, the damn thing is back. And it's very hard to predict that. There are some patients where we've operated on, we said, this, this one's gonna be here 10 years later. Six months later, they're dead. There have been patients where we've operated on and we said, that's it, this guy's gonna be gone in a few months, and next thing you know, that's one of your longest survivors. So we have no way of predicting. Yes, we have histology, we have many other things that give you an idea, but in the end, you really don't know what you're dealing with. And patient selection is the key to having these patients do well. We've looked at PET scan, and we found that PET helps identify 10% who have disease outside of the hemithorax. And in my opinion, I think that's useful. If they have disease outside the hemithorax, maybe we shouldn't be doing those patients. Uh, two cutoff points, one at an SUV of four, one at an SUV of 10. The ones below four do much better than the ones between four and 10, and the ones with an SUV of greater than 10 usually do horribly. Uh, other ways of selecting patients. Um, you can give them chemotherapy ahead of time and see how they do. So here uh, we gave gemcitabine and cisplatin, and when you look at this graph, of course it's biased. Of course the patients who had the extrapleural pneumonectomy were selected, and the ones who did not have resection were selected not to have surgery. But what this does, if you have a patient that you're on the fence with as far as whether or not they should have resection, maybe giving them chemotherapy ahead of time will allow you to see how they will declare themselves. Will they develop METs? Uh, in other places, will their performance status deteriorate to the point where you don't want to operate on those patients? And then Olympta came out, and then um, uh, we had our uh, induction trial, which again did not add much. Um, this is an example of an extrapleural pneumonectomy specimen where you can get the tumor out and it looks oncologically sound. You have nice margins, or whatever we want to call margins, uh, but the tumor is still coming back. Uh, and the chest looks completely clean when you're done. Um, I think as surgeons, a couple of pitfalls to think about, not only when you're doing extrapleural pneumonectomy, but when you're doing pleurectomy, is to make sure that it is mesothelioma from the beginning. When you tell me you have a mesothelioma patient that's surviving 12 years, my first question, are you sure that was really mesothelioma when you started out? 
So I think you have to make sure that you have the appropriate immunohistochemical stainings, electron microscopy before you embark on a mesothelioma case. Um, there's various other little specifics when you're doing the operation, the subclavian vessels, the vena cava, et cetera. I'm not going to go down the list with that, and I'm not going to show you the video. Now I'm going to talk more about pleurectomy decortication. So not all pleurectomy decortications are created equally. Here you have someone with a small amount of disease on the parietal pleura. This operation probably took about 20 minutes. You go ahead and you get everything out, and it's clean. You pop a tube in, and you're done. Most mesos are not like that. Right? So here's another meso where you have big, thick, dense material. Here we are stripping off that entire uh, parietal pleura. And so the entire parietal pleura is gone with all those chunks of meso, and then you're left with the visceral pleura. And with the visceral pleura, you can see these little tiny things uh, on the lung, and so you really have to get into that right plane. It doesn't matter whether they were talc or not. Sometimes the talc makes it easier. Sometimes the talc makes it a little bloodier doesn't matter. You go in there and you can strip that. And the biggest argument is you can't get in the fissures, you can't get it off of this. And here's a tumor, and you can see right in the fissure, there's the pulmonary artery, there's a lymph node that we left right on the pulmonary artery for the picture sh picture's sake. And you can see, you can get it all off. There's the pericardium, diaphragm, etc. So you can get it off. Is it a pain in the butt? Yes. Does the operation take longer? Yes. It's more tedious. I have to say there are many times where I, I feel like, all right, just, let's just do the damn extra pleural pneumonectomy and get over with. So a, a pleurectomy decortication is more tedious. And if you're saving the diaphragm and you're saving the phrenic nerve, maybe it is better to go ahead and save that lung. And here you can see the thick uh, tissue, et cetera. Now, when I finished my training, of course, you know, I drank the Kool-Aid, I was all with the extra pleural pneumonectomy, and I still do extra pleural pneumonectomy. But I had a question as far as which one was better. Now I realize you can't really say which one is better, but um, we did this study where we looked at 663 patients uh, and um, we compared EPP to pleurectomy decortication. What we found is that the pleurectomy group was a little older. Uh, there were uh, a few, uh, similar gender distribution, and that's an important point. As you start looking at more and more studies, it's important to look at the gender distribution. There are more and more women who are being treated with meso, and that can falsely elevate your survival. Women do three times better with mesothelioma than men. And so that's something that you have to always keep in mind when you're looking at these studies. Epithelioid patients, I think that's the only thing that everyone in the room will agree upon, is that epithelioid does better than mixed, does better than sarcomatoid. Early stage, you know what, you can flip a coin with the AGCC staging system. One you can say is a stage two, the other one's a stage three. And it's just, it's so not predictable, especially based on the preoperative scans, what your stage is going to be. So this was survival by histology, this was survival by AGC stage. When we first finished the study, I looked at this and I said, all right, this is great. Extra pleural pneumonectomies do better than pleurectomies. I can justify doing that procedure. But when I looked closely after the following week to submit this abstract, I realized, wow, the pleurectomy curve was the one on top. And then I said, all right, why is that? So we looked in by stage and we found for stage one, pleurectomies were better. For stage two, maybe EPP had a slight edge. Stage three looked exactly the same. Stage four is a big difference. When you go in there and you do an extra pleural pneumonectomy and the patient has advanced disease, where's one of the most likely places that the patient's going to recur? In the contralateral lung. So if you have taken out one lung, the patient doesn't have much in the way you reserve uh, when that tumor comes back. The other uh, one study that I'd like to uh, show you guys is the STEER database. And this has nothing to do with extra pleural pneumonectomy or pleurectomy decortication. It has to do more with what's going out on there in the general population. This was a study of about 6,000 patients. Um, and we wanted to determine the rate of surgical intervention basically in the community. Are these patients getting out to see surgeons who are specializing in mesothelioma? And what we found was that surgery was performed in 23% of the cases. Uh, when we look at our institutions, many of them, I'd say 60% get surgery. When you look uh, in SEER, it's uh, typed by some type of surgery, whether it's a biopsy, talc, et cetera. 
and resection. And when you look at the resection group, there's only three pneumonectomies. So most of those are going to be pleurectomies. And surgery, why no surgery was performed? 57% of the time, it was just not recommended. And this, I think, is one of the most telling slides. And we're actually looking at the, uh, newer data uh, that should be coming out in the next couple of uh, months. But when you look at surgery and you look at the five-year survival, those who had some surgery, 12% survival at five years. So whether it's a biopsy, talc, et cetera, or if they had what appeared to be a pleurectomy and not an extra pleural pneumonectomy, five-year survival is 12% as well. And that would make, that, those numbers make me stop and pause and say, all right, you know, we all have the patients who after surgery are alive eight, nine years later, whether it's with pleurectomy, whether it's with extra pleural pneumonectomy. But there are patients out there who are living a long time without surgery. And so I'm constantly battling within myself as to what are we doing with these patients, how much are we doing with these patients, and exactly are our outcomes based on lead time bias, or our outcomes based on patient selection. And when you look at it, they're small numbers. So whenever you have small numbers, those biases make a big difference. So let's say there's a, a, a woman difference. Let's say you're, uh, a group has double the women than another group. Their survival, I can guarantee you, is gonna be much better. So it's important that you understand all the biases that are involved and how that's gonna affect your survival. So, uh, basically, uh, in conclusion, the surgical mortality for extra pleural pneumonectomy is acceptable. Um, EPP and PD, in my mind, have a similar survival, and the type of surgery you choose should be dictated by the intraoperative findings. I'm not going to say pleurectomy is better or extra pleural pneumonectomy is better. It depends on what you find at the time of surgery. If I can t get out all the tumor that I can see with a pleurectomy, then that's what I do. If I think that I need to do an extra pleural pneumonectomy in that setting to get rid of all the tumor, then that's what I do. If I think I'm going to be leaving a lot of tumor behind, then I will not do an extra pleural pneumonectomy. And down the line, I think we just need better, uh, better modes of treatment. There's giving chemo ahead of time, afterwards, radiation, pre, post. I'm not sure if that's getting us anywhere. And hopefully through the laboratory, we can figure out something. And at least with surgery, we will have tissue that we can look at within the laboratories. Thank you. Thank you.